day we gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the Your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, we're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Oh, open up the heavens, we want to see. to save. Sing this with us.
We're in John 14 as a church. Read it yesterday. Cassie talked to us about it. John 15, John 16. It's almost completely Jesus speaking. If you've got one of the Pew Bibles or you have a red letter Bible, it's all red, all red in these important words Jesus gives us before his arrest, um, sentencing, and crucifixion. David Crowder's captured it well. In those red letters are the words of life, the words of salvation, the very one specific, true, and proven way of salvation through Jesus, the cross, and his resurrection. The altar is always open. You all know that, but I just invite you to come. If, if you just want to get close to the Lord, if you want to worship him, if you want someone to pray with you, our prayer ministers could be glad to pray. This song or Love Ran Red, the next song, Let's turn our attention directly on Jesus who gave us those red letters. There 
there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and Pray together, church. Good songs. Lord Jesus, what you've told us in the Gospels, what you've told us, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I am, you will be with me. I am the vine and you are the branches. In me you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Our Lord Jesus, connect us now. You are the vine and we are your branches. And may your spirit flow to each and every one. That living water that we're asking you for, flowing into the whole body, into this room and out the live stream and touching every heart that is joining in this worship time, Jesus. It comes from you. And it comes because you paid for us at the cross. There is no living water without shed blood. There is no Holy Spirit without true forgiveness, but you have done it. And as we ask you to forgive us and ask you to come in our heart and be our Savior and Lord, you do it gladly, gladly. And we're yours, your church, your church worships you, Jesus. We lift up your name, the name of Jesus over all of our hearts, over all of our assets, over all of our troubles, over all of our sicknesses, 
over all of our decisions. Jesus, you, you are Lord, King, Master, and there is no other. Hallelujah. We feel secure when you are our Master. We feel safe when you are our Shepherd. We love to cuddle up close to you and to each other and rest with you and lay down in the green pasture and have you restore our souls. Jesus, do that now. Restore our souls. Bring us up if we're down. Bring us back if we're far. Light us up if we're close. And may we enjoy you. And, and we, will, we will speak of you freely. You won't have to, to, to push us. You won't have to challenge us. We want to talk about you. We want to. Jesus, we bring specific things. We want to thank you for the experience that our, the boys' basketball team had at Rupp. What, what good basketball. What a time to be Christian in the center of the, the world, or at least in the center of Kentucky, to bring the gospel to Rupp. How cool. Thank you. Thank you for protecting our guys and the experience they had. All of our sports teams, our FFA and our, our band, and we've got volleyball players, God, and we've got um, welders, and we've got instrumentalists. And, wow. Use all these gifts, God, to promote your kingdom, to make Jesus known. That's what it's really about. And, a lot, and the rest is a lot of hard work and a lot of fun. God, we thank you. Thank you for what you're, how you're working in our community. God, we do want to lift up specific uh, persons in our church. Brooke is here. And if you're next to Brooke, would you put your hands on Brooke? God, we lift up her mom, Ann Compton, to you. God, that Ann is home at the hospital. She probably ought to be in rehab. But we pray that you continue to heal her body. We pray that you open her ears. She has experienced hearing loss in this accident. We ask you to open her ears as you did to so many, Jesus, when you walked the earth. Through her daughter now, may a blessing come, healing and hearing. For Robert Dean, Father, would you continue his recovery? Thank you for surgery Tuesday, it went well. For, for Rodney Thornton, we lift him to you. Rodney Thompson, we lift him to you. God, that you, you bring reduced pain. Pain can be managed. Rehab can be opened up if he hasn't found a place yet, it'll open up, and you continue to bring healing to Sarah's dad. Father, we lift up Rick Wilson's sister, Mary Rogers. She had hip surgery, but has not come out of the medications or the anesthesia as normal or desired. So we pray that you would just flush her system of the, the pain meds and the anesthesia and just bring her to a full consciousness and continue the healing you're bringing to her hip. Father, we lift up the Living Last Supper. And church, I ask if you are in the Living Last Supper, that you raise your hand. And church, if you look around, if someone is near you who is in the Living Last Supper, would you put your hands on that person? This is a big responsibility to stand probably in front of 180 people tonight and probably 150 on Wednesday night. Father, I lift up each one and ask you to, to bring your spirit, to bring a wisdom, a memory, to bring a character to help each one portray the disciple or the woman that he or she is portraying. I lift up the music team, Karen and the team, as they bring music that sets the context. And God, I lift up the audience that they would be drawn to Jesus. Jesus, you're the center of the living Last Supper, and rightly so. May you be glorified tonight. May someone come to you in salvation. May many come to you in communion and upbuilding. And God, lastly, we ask you to touch one of our, one of our disciples, his mom is, is ill, Jeannie Brown. Touch Jeannie with, with the gospel and with healing and with love, tons of love. God, would you pour out tons of love on us? You love us, but it hardly, we, sometimes we have a hard time getting it, meaning experiencing it, and that we don't live by experience. But we sure love to feel close to you, God. Would your spirit bring us that closeness to you, to each other? God, thank you. Thank you. Lastly, Father, we lift up the people in Russia, in Moscow, who lost loved ones. 
God, that is so evil and so wrong. We ask you to bathe the world in your Holy Spirit and tromp down the powers of evil, lifting up the name of Jesus, especially in Holy Week and especially on Easter Sunday. God, would you comfort families that lost loved ones, heal those that were hurt, and bring your gospel. All this, Jesus, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's greet one another. Say, say good morning. Give somebody a handshake or a hug. We'll dismiss the uh, children, preschool through second with Rachel and third through fifth with Andrea this morning as they go to class. I'll share just a few announcements with you. Really just a, a big week this week as we have Holy Week and uh, a lot of different activities leading up to next Sunday for Easter. Uh, this afternoon, uh, the youth will be going to a youth rally uh, in, in Greene County at Greensburg Middle School. We're going to actually meet here at the church. It starts at 5. So we're going to meet here at the church at 4. Uh, if any parents want to go, we'd love, love to have you. But it's a great uh, youth rally that they have every year. And tonight is the, uh, is the third night of that. So we'll be going to that at 4. And then uh, at 5 o'clock, Paula Garrison will be leading uh, a membership class. So if you've been coming here and you just want to learn more about our church, doesn't mean that you have to join, but you want to learn more about um, the, the church, we invite you to come out to that this afternoon at 5. And then at 6.30 will be the first presentation of the Living Last Supper. Uh, that will be presented both tonight and Wednesday night at 6.30. So come out uh, one of those nights. It's just a, it's a great time uh, as we bring our focus in this week. Uh, Monday we will have preschool ministry and uh, Lindsay's uh, Q&A question time there at the dining center at 4.30. Uh, Tuesday, uh, this week, Jan Woody's Bible study will be uh, Tuesday, not, not tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And then Wednesday, we'll have our uh, normal uh, prayer times during the day and then with the, uh, the Living Last Supper. We will not have an adult meal, but we will still feed the, uh, the youth and children this Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, there's going to be an outreach at Bridgeport. Uh, so if you'd like to come and help with that at 530, uh, I know that would be greatly appreciated. And then on Friday during the day, there will be a uh, community Good Friday service at Columbia Christian Church, and that's at 12.05. And then, uh, of course, next Sunday is Easter. Uh, between services, we will have an Easter egg hunt at 1010, so that'll be a great time uh, next Sunday. Also, if you'd like to give an offering in the offering box, or for those that watching online, belong at trinity.org is how we give to the church. And so... Uh, that's all the announcements. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Steve, and I think he's got a little something special for us this morning. Far, and, and run up there and grab Harper a microphone. Well, that's, you can get a mic. Uh, Ashley, Dean's dad, had surgery. Robert had surgery Tuesday, and so we're sitting there in the waiting room at the Somerset um, Lake Cumberland, big long name, Regional Community Medical Center, and we're, we're chatting. You know, Ashley's real shy. It really took a while for me to get her to open up, but uh, once she did, and I'm only joking, Ashley, Ashley could talk with the best of them. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I could too, so we're sitting there gabbing away. And she said, you know, Harper, Harper's been doing this thing with her softball team, and, and she, I'm so proud of her. She just kind of gets them, and she gets them to say something, and, and they, 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 now they say it all together, and they kinda, it's their huddle before they do the game. And she prays, and sometimes the other, other players will pray before the game, and and Ashley was just, just beaming, telling about her daughter. Harper, you, you, were, you were very well represented. So then, of course, my wheels are always turning. Hmm, that would, that would be great for the church. If a softball team can huddle around, uh, she says, I think it's, uh, we're forgiven, we're family. They may have a little adaptation. So I texted Harper last night. I said, Harper, how about you do that for church? I copied Wes because I wanted him to know she was coming. And I said, and, and maybe Wes help you if you want him to. Oh, yeah, that'd be good if Wes could help me. That would be good. So Wes and Harper, come up and lead us in a pregame cheer. 
So I've never heard this pregame cheer. Is this something like you say and the team says back to you? Is that how it works? Yeah. So that means we say it and you all have to, what do they have like to do? I say we are and then you say forgiving. We are friendly. We are patient. All right, y'all got that? She's going to say we are and we're going to say forgiven. You're going to say we are, we're going to say family. family. You're going to say we are and we're going to say freed. Can y'all do that? Forgiven, family, freed. Y'all going gonna to have to stand up. I don't think y'all can do it sitting down. Y'all going to have to stand up. Come on now. All right, lead us. We are. Forgiven. We are. Family. We are. Freed. One more time. We are. Forgiven. We are. Family. We are. Freed. Oh, that's good. Is that good? All right. Good job. Let me take it. Practice Harper next Sunday. We're going to do it on Easter Sunday. That will be so fun. There'll be twice as many people in here. We're going to do it. You'll you will love it. You'll be broadcast around the world. We are forgiven. We are family. We are freed. That that is awesome. Um, more adventures in the life of Trinity Church. And it's talking to a, a a family, a woman this week, who wanted to connect to the church, but she doesn't live here. And we've never really created a way to connect to the church if you don't live here. But she's kind of between churches and between living locations. And I said, well, yeah, we, we can help you out. And so I want to give a shout out to Chana Arnett. Hello, Chana and your family. They live in McGoffin County. And they're our, our first active online attendees. If you want to know, that, is that a status? It is now. We just created it. So she's a part of the church. Chana, you're a part of the church. She gets the text that we text out. She watches. She's been watching for four months. And so it's time for her to be an active online attendee. And I don't know where to go from there, but we'll think of something even from there. And then Wes, I had the wild idea. She's moving to Georgetown. She's a nurse practitioner. I had a wild idea that we plant a campus in Georgetown, Trinity Church, Georgetown, a satellite campus. And once every two or three months, you or I will go up there and preach live, but we'll live stream. That's just thinking. But you never know. In this day and age of connection, now, Chana, I've embarrassed you. And the fun part is, Chana will be here next Sunday. She wanted to come Easter Sunday, so they're driving in from, from Salyersville to Columbia to worship. So that's so cool. It's just, that's the Lord doing it. I tell you, Tuesday, so many things opened up. I was like, Lord, wow, wow, wow. That was the morning Ashley and I were, were talking. And, I got, and Ashley and I met three Christians in the waiting room also. And she knew that story was coming. I'll tell you about them at the end of the message. Um, a woman, two men, two are happy with the church and one not. That, we'll just go from there. I said, okay, and I won't give his name, but if you ever watch the Flintstones, you might guess his name. Okay, let's go into this message today, the third message in what Jesus... Oh, I can just hear that racket that's making. There we go. It is finished. These are three profound profound words. And for the points, God gave the points. He said, now Steve, just take it as finished and put three things to it. It was, it was started, it was secret, and it is specific. We're going to talk about those three things. It was started, it was secret, and it was specific. And that specific word has really grown even from last night to this morning. That's where the heart of the message is. There's specific things that God has to do or wants us to do, and he had Jesus to do, and that's where we're going. So would you stand and we can read together? This is the Palm Sunday passage. You have heard John 19 when we, said, when we read that Jesus said, I thirst, and then the Bible says he bowed his head. And then he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We read that last week. That's, that's going to be where we get to with this message. But let's start on Palm Sunday. As the children wonderfully showed us, the people actually did wave palm branches and lay down their clothes before Jesus. So let's, let's read together. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. 
And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the ground. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We act this out. We have plays. Donkeys have crosses on their backs, marking them as the special animal Jesus rode. Palm branches, uh, we burn them in Ash Wednesday. We use the ashes to mark our heads. And now we're 34 days into Lent since Ash Wednesday with six more to go. We're almost there. Can you believe Jesus had to fast for 40 days? You feel, now you feel what 40 days is and like, wow, I am ready for this to be done. I, I am ready for those things that I've given up to enjoy them. You may feel the same way. Or, or, or maybe not. But we're so ready to bring the focus to Jesus as, as in that Passover week, the focus came on him as he came into Jerusalem. Now, a multitude, uh, Matthew's not exaggerating. Every Jewish man had to be in Jerusalem for Passover. It's required in the book of Exodus. One of the three main feasts of Israel, and every man and family had to be there. And every bit of leaven had to be thrown out of the house. If you ate leaven during this special time, it's all over. Very important, unleavened, unleavened bread, remembering the, the, the fast exodus out of Egypt. Remembering to gird your loins, which means tie up your robe, eat quickly, and go. It's time to go. So the Jews are preparing to remember this. We have it, it'll be this Thursday. We call it Monday Thursday. They call it Passover. In that Passover, Jesus took the bread and did something very different. He took the cup and did something very different. And we have Holy Communion right out of the Passover meal. So Matthew writes this in such a way, the Holy Spirit had him write it, in such a way to lead us to the question, who is this? It says, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? You can't tell me they didn't know who it was. They knew exactly it was Jesus of Nazareth. They were all looking for him. They're either looking for him to raise them up to overthrow Rome, or they're looking for him to arrest him and put him to death. One or the other, but everybody was looking for him, and they all knew who he was. So why does Matthew ask, who is this? He's talking to us. To those who are going to read this years, years later, and asking the question, who is this? Who is this to you? You know, Jesus asked that of his own disciples. He said, who do people say that I am? Well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And that's one of Peter's most wonderful moments. He, he stands up, perks up and says, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but God has revealed this to you. And so we know out of Peter's mouth, Jesus is the Son of God. 
We are gathered here. We believe this. It's our core belief. It's in our articles of religion. It's in the Word of God. So if I was to ask you, what do you believe about Jesus? If if you took the question, who is this? And who is Jesus to you? Let's look at eight different questions. Eight different answers you might have. You might say he's a man. You might say he's a Jew. You might say he's a teacher. You might say he's a prophet. You might say he's the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. How far down the list would you go? And I know you, and I know Trinity, and I know we are checking every box on that chart. Every box on that chart we believe core belief. But guess what? A country in the news every day, Israel, as a nation, can only check the first four boxes. They believe he was a man. They knew he was a Jew. They did believe he was a teacher. And they, the good ones of them that accepted him to a degree believe he was a prophet. But they don't believe he's the Messiah. And they have taken awful consequences because they did not believe he's the Messiah. He proved it to them in his teaching. He proved it to them in the signs and wonders. He proved it to them, fulfilling, like we talked about, 300 prophecies. And they still didn't believe. When he comes into Jerusalem, they still did not believe. Caiaphas says it's more expedient that one man be put to death for the nation than the whole nation to be destroyed. Caiaphas is the high priest. That was the view to put one man to death. What one man? To put Jesus to death so that Rome wouldn't come in and take away their government and take away Caiaphas' position. Very selfish. Very, very wrong. But that was the view of the Jewish leaders. And unfortunately, that didn't change. They still can only check four boxes. Well, that doesn't stop the gospel. There were many Jews who did believe. John and Mary are at the cross. They believe. Check all eight boxes. The other disciples, when they rallied back, they chose the twelfth. They all believed. And the early church believed all twelve boxes and everything in the New Testament. All the way to today, we believe everything in the New Testament about Jesus. Everything. So how do we get this word out? How do we share it? How do we let people know that when he said it is finished, which in that Aramaic speaking tongue, it really meant it is paid. It is paid in full. I remember asking Donna Hancock, Donna, have you got a paid in full stamp at the newspaper? Yeah, she found one. And one of these Palm Sundays, we stamped every one of your hands that wanted stamped. Paid, paid, paid. Paid because he's paid for you in full. We understand that. We love to see that. This church has seen that across two big loans. Paid in full. Paid in full. Wow. And so we want to look into when Jesus said it is finished. Let's ramp up to that. First, first thing I want to take from that was it was started. It was started. It means, it means the, the payment for sin, the plan of salvation. That's the it. It was started. It was started with Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.15. Right after Adam and Eve sinned and God found them, He says this, I will put enmity between you, the tempter, and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Well, sure enough, the enemy is striking Jesus' heel. He'll he'll use Judas to do that in the Last Supper. He strikes our heel. Weird things happen. Did you see the projectors not go turn themselves off before church? One minute before church. What are all those people running around down there for? Because we have no projectors, which you don't have to have a projector to worship, but it sure helps. And this has never done that before. You just have to be ready for all kinds of little bites on the heel. So you know why? So Jesus can come along and take his word to the enemy and just go, crush! Crush his head. That's one of my favorite parts of the Passion of the Christ. When Jesus takes his foot, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that white snake slithers up, and he takes his foot, and he goes, 
pow, and in the theater they have it, all those speakers, pow, and it crushes Satan's head. Because when Jesus said it is finished, our sin is paid, and Satan, your rule is finished. You are no longer the ruler of the earth. You are broken, you are conquered, you are condemned. It started in Genesis. And then it continues in Genesis with Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 22, 8, Abraham answered, he answered to Isaac, God himself will provide the lamb. God himself will provide the lamb. Referring to Isaac was going to be the sacrifice. I mean, that's really barbaric, but that's what was going to happen until Abraham proved his faithfulness, had Isaac on the, on the altar and ready to kill him, his own loved son, and then God said, stop! You have proven your faith completely to me. Untie him and sacrifice the ram caught in the thicket. I mean, Abraham was willing to give his only son. Our Father in heaven has given his only son. It is Abraham. Abraham may have saved us with that very move. And then Moses and Israel, it was started in Exodus 12, 13. The blood will be a sign for you on your houses where you are. When I see the blood... I will pass over you. The angel of death will pass over that house and go on to another house, go into the Egyptians' houses that had no blood over their doorposts and their lentils, no no blood, no protection, and their firstborns, all of them died. Raise your hand if you're a firstborn. We would be gone if we were Egyptian at that time. That's why blood begins to take on a meaning in Exodus. Exodus 13, 13, redeem with a lamb every firstborn among you. Oh, I'll get my lamb, redeem me, Lord, please. Now, we don't do that anymore. That's the Old Testament. That's the old system. That's the the law of Moses. And we do not offer sacrifices of sheep or lambs or doves anymore. Well, nor does Israel because they have no temple. And they have no temple because they would not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So God let Rome come in and rip it down in A.D. 70. And it's never been built back. When it is built back, have your heart ready. I mean, have your heart ready all the time, but you better be super ready if you start to hear them talking about they're going to build the temple in Israel. That's a sign of the end times. Book of Daniel. The blood in Leviticus 17 The life of the creature is in its blood. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The problem is, it has to be innocent blood. And none of us has innocent blood. We've all sinned and fallen short. We've all been selfish and messed up. We've all thought things, done things, and said things that weren't right. And, ah, we feel bad after. But we have been, as our new chant says... We are forgiven. Because when we repent and ask God, He forgives us. Harper, there's a slight chance I'll bring you back up to lead us in at the end. Okay, just be ready. In church, be ready. It's forgiven, it's family, and freed. Wes, help me remember those. You better come up and help both of us. Second thing, it was secret. It was secret. Jesus came walking, carried into Jerusalem on the, on the donkey, the colt of a donkey, which is a small donkey. And if you've ever ridden a donkey, he's at eye level with everybody. He's not up on a big white horse, not yet. He's on a donkey, a very approachable. Jan Woody, I, I copied the picture you made of Jesus on the donkey. It's in my phone. I never got it to the projection. But Jan, look at her Facebook page, and you will see a picture of Jesus on the donkey, and she shows him very welcoming, very warm, very approachable. He's not a militant Jesus. He's a redeeming Jesus. And the secret was, he was coming into Jerusalem not to lead a revolt, but to bring redemption. All eyes were on Jesus, the zealots, and all of the fired-up Jewish men ready to, ready to fight Rome are all looking for the signal for him to say, grab your weapon, 
Grab your weapon. There's a million of us and maybe a thousand of them. Grab your weapon. Let's go. That's what they were really looking for. Let's overthrow Pilate, overthrow the centurions, overthrow the soldiers, and take Jerusalem for ourselves and win it back. That would have lasted for about two weeks until the Roman reinforcements came in and obliterated Israel. So that wasn't a very good idea. Jesus came in secret. That's why the people got a little edgy. Well, are, are you going to do something or not? The Romans were very edgy because they knew the crowd, size of the crowd. And the chief priests are edgy because they know they've got to get Jesus in the grave. Because if he did lead the whole country, he would be their leader, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law would be O-U-T, out. No one's listening to them anymore. They're listening to Jesus. After he came in on the donkey, he went into the temple to teach. Nobody arrested him. They didn't dare arrest him. The rocks would cry out. What does that mean? You want to throw some stones? Just try to arrest me and watch what happens. Watch what the people do. They couldn't touch Jesus until they got him alone away from the people. And you'll hear about that tonight. That was Judas' horrible role. And the chief priest backed him. It was secret. A secret plan, a secret payment, a secret ransom. Listen to what the Word of God says about this secret. In Matthew 20, 28, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. Now there's the word ransom. Ransom is a payment to free somebody held hostage. We are held hostage by Satan. The payment was innocent blood. Listen to 1 Peter 18 and 19. Now, this is purposely complicated. Now, I don't know why Peter and Paul want to write so many words in one sentence, but they do. I'm going to simplify this in a moment, but stay with me. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's a lot. You know what we need from that verse? We need, here's the, here's the trimmed version. We need, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. That's the truth. That's what we need. Everything else is helpful, but we've got to know you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Now, it's still not a secret yet. This is pretty obvious. Shouldn't everybody know that somebody has to give their life for the world? No, they did not know that. That was a mystery. That was a secret. Nobody knew that the second Adam, that the the life of one innocent man sacrificed could pay for everybody's sins. Big secret. Here's where it says it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In these chapters at the beginning of Corinthians, Paul is all over the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. Now he's in Corinth. He is in Greece. Took the grandkids to see my sister yesterday. We're driving in the country in Pulaski or Rock Castle County. And we're talking about Greek. They're starting to study Greek mythology. It's okay, Greek mythology. Those are all a bunch of false gods. But that's what they had, and then one of them was studying, someone didn't believe that, and they were poisoned. Um, so we're talking about Greek and Greece, and it said, in Greece, they thought, they thought they knew so much, but they didn't. This is what Paul writes to that, that church in Corinth. But we speak, we speak, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden or secret wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. None of the rulers of this age knew, rulers being spiritual rulers and Jewish rulers. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had they known Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to pay for all sin, Satan and Caiaphas never would have crucified Jesus. 
but they didn't know. God doesn't tell everything he knows. He doesn't have to tell everything he knows. He has secrets, and he has more secrets, and the more you study the Word and, and get to know him, he shares secrets. He wants to see if, you can, if he can trust you. Oh, Lord, we love to learn. It was secret. So it was started in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. It was secret. It was secret until Jesus says, it is finished. And why is he saying it is paid? Why is he saying that? Until they came to understand. <coughs> That's the payment for sin. Lastly, it is specific. It is specific. That's the verb tense change because it is still specific. It is still the only way of salvation. Karen, Karen's got a fenced-in garden because we've got a lot of deer where we live, and they would love to come up and nibble on all her plants. She got so mad last year when the rabbits ate her beans. We've got, now we've got four foot of chicken wire added to the six-foot fence. So we've got this fortress of a garden. Um, but it needed a new post. It needed a new post, so we've got to go look for a post. So we're out on the property looking for a post. She wants cedar this time. Okay, we found a cedar. One trip, we found a couple of posts. But honestly, they tapered too much, and by the time you get to the top, there's not enough to screw to. So I said, let's get another one. And I had a sense in my heart of where to go. So I went in one of, the, one of the access roads there, and I was going to the wrong part looking for this post. And I knew in my heart I was in the wrong part. You ever done that? I'm just going to look over here because there might be something more secret special over here. And I'm being foolish because the Holy Spirit was telling me where the post is. And I'm like, I think I can find it. one. But then I finally yield. Okay, okay, let me go over to this part where he's telling me to go. So I'm going over to this part. And then sure enough, there is a beautiful, straight, about that round, all the way up, very little taper, beautiful cedar tree. I get permission from my foreign woman to cut it, cut it down, prune it up, take it back, put it in. It's beautiful. She says, I want them all to be cedar now. So, oh, no, I've got more posts to replace. Here's the point. It was specific. The Holy Spirit knew the post. And I'm wandering around when I should be going right to it. Specific. It is specific. The plan of salvation was very specific. That the Son of God would come, be born of a virgin, would live his life, do incredible miracles, and he would give his life on Calvary on the cross. He would give the sacrifice for sin. He would make the payment for sin. Very specific. Church, is there any other way to be saved other than the belief in the Son of God, number eight, Son of God, who gave his life at Calvary to pay for our sin and was raised on the third day to prove it all? Is there any other way of salvation? Online, is there any other way of salvation? This is where we have to hold our ground and never compromise and never yield. There is only one way of salvation. We can get along wonderfully with everybody, but when they ask us, well, what's your way of salvation? Jesus through the cross and his resurrection. And they offer the, us their way of salvation. To, well, I do lots of good works. Do you think I'll go to heaven? I'm like, oh, I'm not the judge, but... The Word says, by repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Specific. Very specific. John 14, 6. Our March verse for our fasting was, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I didn't give you the rest of it on the first day of March, but here's the rest of it. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Does that mean you're the only way to make it to the Father to be, to be saved? Well, let's look at another verse, Acts 4.12. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's very specific. And so Jesus is the specific offering, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made Christ who never sinned to be offering for our sin that we could be made right with God through Christ. 
And 5.21 is an amazing verse, but jump back one verse to 2 Corinthians 5.20, and here we come in. Here's us to know Jesus and to make Him known. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making His appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We implore you, we beg you, we encourage you, we exhort you, be reconciled to God. Ask for forgiveness. Ask Him into your heart. Be right with God. We're the ambassadors now. How about, I need to get you all some fancy robes and things. I'm the ambassador from Columbia. I'm the ambassador from Flatwoods. And I'm the ambassador from, from Milltown. We carry an incredible message from our king. I close with this. Pastor John was on an airplane flying uh, into Chicago. He'd just come from somewhere and he really liked to rest. There was his seat and then five empty seats and another fellow over here. He was really thinking about laying down those armrests or putting them up and then just laying down and resting. But he didn't. He thought, well, I should listen to this person sitting by the window. So he introduces himself, say, hey, I'm, I'm John, and hey, I'm Dick, and hey, uh, I used to be in the Army Intelligence. Ah, me too, I used to be in Army Intelligence. Very cool. Um, where are you from? Well, Beatrice, Nebraska. Never heard of it. Well, from Beatrice, Nebraska. And of course, the fellow by the window is sitting this way, and, and Pastor John's looking this way, and they're just talking about life. And yeah, I got, I've got my wife and three children. Yeah, me too. I've got a wife and three children. Neat. And, uh, but that's about all they had in common. After that, John started to realize that when Dick would look at him, this side of his face was just kind of eaten up. Basal cell uh, cancer. Skin cancer. And so he shared, you know, I, I'm on my way home. The doctor said, we, we agreed together, no more treatment. No more treatment. I, I just want to live with my children. What I've, the time I've got left, I want to live at full throttle. And he had six to eight months left. So John says, man, you, sure, you care if I share something with you? And he takes out his pencil and paper and writes down his version of the four spiritual laws. Uh, man is sinful and separated from God and only Jesus Christ can bridge that gap. He said, could I, could I invite you to follow Jesus? And Dick said, yes. Yes, please do. Could I pray with you? Says John, yes, please do. So the flight attendant says, uh, we're on our descent to Chicago O'Hare Airport. So somewhere about 10,000 feet in the air, John is leading Dick to Christ and he accepts Christ, and man, he just lights up. He is so excited. He's got a future. Maybe not on earth, but he's got a future forever with Jesus. Specific man, specific flight, specific placement, specific conversation. You might ask me, well, Steve, is God always specific? Isn't, isn't there anything just kind of like, well, just do what you want? And if you push me on, I'm going to say, you know, God is pretty specific every time. Every time. That's not the end of the story. That was in November. John had to preach in New, in, uh, New York, and he's flying back to Chicago. Gets, in his, gets, in his, gets his seat from his ticket, sits down next to a woman, and they're flying. He's thinking, yeah, I ought to just kind of talk to this woman and live in to give into her life and listen to her story. And so he does. And so hey, my name's John, and, and she says, yeah, my name's uh, June, and where are you from? I'm from Nebraska. You know any, you familiar with Nebraska? Oh, maybe. Where in Nebraska? Beatrice. Ah, oh, you know Dick. He's the controller at the Lutheran Hospital. You know Dick? Yeah, I, I met him. I talked to him. I got to know him here on the flight. That's my son. That's my son. So yeah, I prayed with him right about where we're starting to descend into O'Hare, right about this, this high, this altitude. As so I prayed with him, he accepted Christ. Yes, he's been so excited. He's been into the Word. He's been talking to his pastor. He's been worshiping. He's been, he's been living for Jesus. He took it seriously. And of course, John would just smile. And he offered to her, hey, do you mind if I pray with you? Oh, please do. She, took, she grabbed his hand. Let's pray. 
And I don't know if it was her salvation prayer or a word of encouragement for a mom whose child is sick, but he prayed for her and she was very encouraged. And then she said at the end, she said, you know, it's, it's no coincidence I was sitting here just before you got on board. A woman came to me and said, could we trade seats? And I came here and you're there. Church, God is very specific. When He wants the gospel and His support and love to go out, He will place you with people. He put Ashley and me in that waiting room. Of course, she's there with her dad, and we're there talking, and we found out that Harper can cheer and pray and having a great time. And we met one woman going to have her fifth hip or knee surgery. Ashley, I forget, but man, she was up there in the, in the joint department. We're like, wow, do they not do a good job or what? Are we in the wrong place? Uh, but she, she talked to us. She was a warm woman in the Lord, wonderful. And this other fellow, kind of a bearded fellow with a vest, blue jean vest, said, yeah, I've been here before. All the doctors want to do is, they always want to do surgery. Very, you know, kind of like, I mean, these are two top neurosurgeons. They just want to do surgery. They can't think of anything else. I'm <laughs> like, well, okay. We didn't really pursue it because he just didn't seem like he wanted to pursue it. Ashley said, hush. <laughs> So it came around later, we're talking more. I don't know what we're talking about, but he chimed back into the conversation. So I asked him, I'm trying to learn to engage people, even not my people in the waiting room. I says, hey, you know, we're, Ashley's dad is in surgery. We go to church together. And uh, where do you go to church? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't go to anywhere. So you've been baptized? Yes. So you're a Christian? Yes. Well, why don't you go to church? I can't find one. What do you mean? There's all kinds of churches in Pulaski County. You can't find one. I can, well, every church I go to, the people don't live it out. They're one thing in church, and there's something else out on the street. Oh. So Ashley tells me to hush again. Oh, no, let's find out what's going on. Let's find out what's going on. So have you been a Christian all your life? Nope. I was terrible. I would fight and cuss. I was mean. My name, my old name, which is that Flintstones name, I kept it, but it wasn't a good name. I said, okay, you are very street smart. And street smart people can not judge to condemn, but judge to evaluate people. He, he was looking at us. So he's, he's seeing if we're going to say, oh, it's okay. You should find a church. And they don't really mean it. So no, that's one of the things that plagues the church. Hypocrisy sets us back. Sorry, man. Sorry. I admitted it to him. So he stayed in the dialogue. Okay, let's talk more. He's fidgety, but he stayed with us. And then, then I, I was going to head out, and I headed out. And here I hear him again. I'm looking for the wrong place for my cedar tree. I'm going out the door, and I'm supposed to be praying with the guy, so the Spirit's talking to me. Pray with him. Pray with him. I'm out. Both doors of the surgery waiting room. I'm out. All right. I turn around, go back in. Ashley's like, what is he doing? No, she, Could I pray with you? He said, sure. We had a little trust going on. Even the Christian man who's the clerk came out from his booth and said, I want to listen to this. That's okay. We got an audience now. So I prayed for him that he would experience Jesus afresh. Ashley and I were little ambassadors for Jesus to one of our own people, his own people. So church, here's the point. When Jesus said it's finished, it was started years ago. It was secret, but not anymore. And it is specific. The way of salvation is specific, and your placement and my placement is specific. There are going to be 12 men, 13 men across the table, and they're all specific. I'm praying about, Lord, who here? Who here? Who here? And the Lord gives me names. Some accept, some decline. Um, Lord, who's going to be the woman? Who's going to be the second woman? Lord, what are we going to do? And He is placing you. He is placing you. Because I'm like, this is a big operation. We have eight new people in the program tonight. So would you all come out and smile at them? They're going to be nervous, but they're going to do the best they can. It's specific. So what's the invitation? About everybody in this room knows Christ, but I don't know about our online campus now. If everybody online belongs to Jesus, the first thing I'm supposed to offer you is salvation in Jesus. And the second thing I'm to offer you is a church home. A church home. Where you know and love each other. 
I, I'm feeling so good about Adair County. I was in the Somerset Walmart yesterday with my grandchildren. We've been on our mission, and part of their third mission, they get a little reward. And someone had an Adair County sweatshirt on. She was a teen girl, and we're pushing our buggy this way. She goes that way. I just said, hey, there's someone from Adair County. And she starts cracking up, laughing. I'm like, what did I say? And the kids are like, Dad, you shouldn't have, Granddad, you shouldn't have said that. So I just said she's from Adair County. I felt like this kinship. Because when we went to Rupp, and that was so cool to see you all and see all the pictures, our guys are at Rupp Arena. They had to close Walmart. When you all left town, they closed Walmart. Nobody could work. I mean, it just, it was very cool. It is so good to be in the Lord Jesus and in his church with people that love him. And I invite you that are watching, and maybe you're just checking us out from a distance, to come in person, especially next Sunday. Jesus is everything he said. And the church, well, we're trying to be everything he wants us to be. We're not there, but we admit we're not perfect, but he's here. Each of you has a specific job this week, whether it's outreach on Thursday or Living Last Supper on Sunday and Wednesday or preschool or, or youth tonight in Greensburg. There's so many different assignments in the classroom, on the farm, in the office, on the, on the, on the road. Let's spread Jesus. Let's remember what he did. I didn't even get to talk about his betrayal. I didn't get to talk about Peter denying. I didn't get to talk about the pain and the agony and all that he went through for us to get to that point to say, it's finished. It's paid. And you're mine. You're mine. Yes, we are, Lord Jesus. So it is so good. His altar is open if you want prayer. I'd be happy to pray with you, but let's also remember his love. Let's remember him. Easton, help us out. I've heard it said that a man will climb the mountain just to be with the one he loves. How many times has he broken that promise? It has never been done. I've never climb the highest mountain but I walk the hill the Calvary just to be with you I would do anything there's no price I would not pay just to be I would give anything, I would give my life away, yeah. I've heard it said that a man has found the ocean just to be with the one he loved, but all those dreams all an empty emotion It can never be done I never swam the deepest ocean But I walked upon the raging sea Just to be with you I'd do anything but there's no price I would not pay Just to be with you I would give anything I would give my life away yeah, yeah. And I know you don't understand The fullness of my love how I died upon the cross for your sin And I know that you don't realize How much that I gave you But I promise I'll do it all again Just to be with you I've done everything 
There's no price I did not pay yeah. Just to be with you I gave everything Yes, I gave my life away yeah. I gave my life away Whoa. to be with you just to be with you all oh, just to be I'm not really sure how we're supposed to end this service. I think Harper's supposed to come back up. Harper, if you would make your way forward. You know, that, uh, that word specific is a word I struggle even saying, for those of you who know me very well. But I think that's a really powerful word. That, that God, even to the point he wants to show us the tree to cut for a post. I mean, the Bible says he knows the number of hairs on our head, right? He cares about the details of our life how you spend your money, how you spend your time, how you lead your family, how you interact, where you go, where you don't go, what job you take, what job you don't take. I mean, I could go on and on. And I believe there's freedom in having that intimate, close relationship with the Father that He guides us in our everyday life. It's not just a Sunday morning service. It's about truly having a relationship with Him and Him guiding us, knowing that we're forgiven, knowing that we are family, and knowing that we are free to live the life He's called us each to live. So come on up, Harper. Give her a microphone, Easton, behind you there. We're going to do our chant one more time. You guys got to stand. So it's forgiven, family, freed. Okay, I have to tell myself that. Forgiven, family, freed. All right, lead it. We are. Forgiven. We are. Family. We are. Free. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the plan of salvation. Thank you that you are very detailed. And God, you want us to lean in and to know you. And God, you want to reveal things to us. So thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you have done for us. And help us to go out and to be Jesus to the world. Help us to go out and spread your love and spread your forgiveness to others, Father God, that, that, that you offer to us. So thank you for the church. Bless each one. Lead God and direct us this week. In Jesus' name and all the churches.